Pastor Byron, come and tell us about Jesus. Pretty cool. You may take your seats. I got to tell you, I mean, uh, I'm one of your online viewers. And uh, I've watched the transformation over a period of time of your stage. And I've got to tell you, to be here in person makes it uh, so much bigger uh, than online. Well done. Doesn't it look cool? I mean, it's just awesome what you've done. And uh, yeah, g give yourselves a great big hand for that. You probably don't realize it, but uh, all over the world, people tune in and check you out. And uh, you inspire us. You really do. You inspire us. So it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I think this is, I think, maybe my third time that I've had the privilege of, of uh, being on this platform. And um, Annie and I, we, we, just, we just love people. Uh, we pioneered a church. Uh, over 20 years ago now, 21, 22 years ago now, and started with 12 people uh, in an old hall and uh, rolled out the carpet, put out the chairs. I was the song leader. It was pretty terrible. Uh, people actually told us years later um, that they deliberately came late to miss the worship. <laughs> Doesn't do a lot for your ego right there. But um, we got better at it, and uh, I stepped down and handed it over, but I was the first uh, worship leader that they had. And uh, so, uh, you know, God has blessed us. I've got to tell you, we, we just have seen the grace of God uh, over that period of time. I want to share a revelation with you tonight that I received. Excuse me. I'm a pastor, right? And my heart is to see people grow and develop. I just love to see people growing and going forward with great strength. I think the people of God should be victorious, don't you? Yeah. I think the people of God should be the head and not the tail. Yeah. And I love to see the people of God rise up and embrace everything that Jesus died for. Yeah. And this message tonight was a revelation that came to me. It's called Salvation Has Two Directions. And I thought about that, it clicked with me one day and I got it. And we know that salvation has an eternal direction. But I added to that, you know, this revelation that salvation has an internal direction. Let, let's have a look at this in Hebrews chapter 5. We'll start with the eternal direction. It says, uh, Jesus, speaking about Jesus, it says uh, in verse 8, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So people come to a point in their lives where this revelation comes alive. They understand for the first time what Jesus Christ actually did for them and they embrace salvation. They come to Jesus and they know that, that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that all of their past has been washed away, that there's a clean start. You know, it's brand new for each one of them. And they embrace that and they know that one day, one day when that time comes, they will spend eternity with Jesus. And I look at that as, as the eternal salvation. But sadly, as a pastor, what I see in many people's lives, it's like they... Uh, do, you, do you have deli counters here? Do you know what that is? A supermarket, and you go to the deli, and then, you know, you've got the cold meats and the bacon, which is so popular. Um, you know, and uh, I, I, I saw it like this. I saw people coming to the deli counter and, and taking a ticket. Do you do that here? You take your ticket and you step back with all the other people and you're standing there and you're waiting for your number to be called. And you know, some people view salvation, eternal salvation like that. It's like they come to Jesus and they're broken and they're hurting and they embrace him and they, they, you know, they, they give their life to Jesus. They say the sinner's prayer and it's just like that. then that's it. They just sit and wait for the number to come up. Now, they're saved, no two ways about it. They have an eternal destiny. But I've got to tell you, Jesus died for much more than that, amen? 
Jesus died for a greater salvation than just one day we'll go to heaven. But we'll experience that internal salvation right now. Salvation is not just eternal, but it's internal. You see in Acts chapter 2, Peter's addressing the crowd and he's talking about the last days and there's amazing signs and wonders that were going to take place. And in verse 21 of chapter 2 he says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I looked at that word saved and I, I, I discovered the understanding of, of that, the, the context of this word saved. And it says deliver or healed, preserved, to save self, to do well, to be made whole. I thought, wow. It gave me this, in, this in, in expansive understanding of what salvation really means. It's not only that one day I will go to be with Jesus, that I will have an eternal salvation, absolutely, no question. But do you know the revelation came to me is that I can be saved every day from any situation, from any circumstance, from anything in my heart that is causing me damage and destruction, from attitudes, from experiences, from, from examples that take place. I can be saved and made whole every day of my life. Salvation is not only eternal, it's internal. And it's my op opportunity, listen to this, to be saved from myself. Amen? Oh, that's not a, that's not a comfortable thought. But I tell you what, if you catch the revelation of this tonight, it, it, will, it will transform your entire life. Because contrary to popular belief, the church, the pastor... Your spouse is not the source of all of your troubles. Myself is. Myself is the source of, of most of the troubles in my life. And I think we've missed that because, you know, we've embraced this eternal salvation, which is fantastic. But God's salvation allows me to save myself from myself. We're not still standing in line waiting for our number to be called. Amen? We've got work to do. We've got, we got something to build. We have a saying in our church, you can have whatever you want, but you've got to build it. You can have whatever you want. You want a good marriage, you can have it, but you've got to build it. You've got to sit down and say, okay, how can we make this the best marriage ever? And we build it. We build it. We put ourselves aside and we build something that will only God. Let's have a look at this tonight. I've got three points. The first one is to know God. You see, we'll never get this without knowing God. Not knowing about him, but knowing him. Peter, Peter nailed it in, in John chapter 6, 67 to 69. Jesus was telling the people some really hard truths. He was telling them some hard truths and they were thinking, whoa, I don't know whether I can handle that. I, I don't know whether, whether I can wear that. And they started to, to dissipate. They started to back off. They started deserting him. And then he turns to his disciples and he said, well, you know, what about you? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? We have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Many people have taken a ticket and they're waiting for that number to come and be called. But they don't know him. They don't know him. You know, we have a saying in our church that you can be in church, but are you in Christ? That's the difference. That's the difference. We've got to know Him. Know Him. And I tell you, to know Him, when you know Him, there's a hunger to know Him more. There's a hunger to know Him more. You know, I had people say to me, you know, many times as a pastor, well, you know, uh, no, nobody followed me up. Nobody called me. No, no, no one chased after me. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, when I was born again, nobody chased me either. 
The only chasing was to chase me away because I was at the church every day. Every opportunity, I went to every meeting except the women's meetings. I even tried to sneak into the youth, but I was a bit too old for that. I loved it. I'd found God. You see, for 25 years, I'd never went to church my whole life. But at 25, I was on the carpet in my house and I said, Jesus, if you're real, not expecting anything to happen. I had a mate who was witnessing to me and he was annoying me, annoying me. He kept telling me about Jesus and kept playing Christian music and leaving a Bible open. I worked with the guy and the Bible was always open on the desk. And I'm thinking, you know, if he wasn't so big, I'd hit this guy. And I thought, this is my plan. What I'll do, I'll I'll, I'll say the prayer. And nothing's going to happen. And I'll go and tell him and say, mate, look, I said the prayer. Um, It's good for you, but, you know, I'm not interested. So I said this prayer on, on, on the lounge room floor. And I said this. I said, God, if you're real, you show me, I'm in. 100%. That's all I said. I'd grown up in an alcoholic's home where both parents died alcoholics in their early 50s. Seven kids, dirt poor. I started drinking at the age of 16 and never stopped until 25 years of age. I'd start drinking at 6 in the morning before work, then morning tea, then the pub at lunch, and then after, after work till drop, every day of my life, within one week I couldn't take alcohol into my body. Within one week, that prayer that I said that I thought, nah, nothing's going to happen, it's just I can get out of this thing with this bloke. And he delivered me. He said, I said, if you're real, and he showed me he was real. And I said to Annie, I said, I said oh, gee, I think there's something in this Jesus stuff. <laughs> I said, I can't drink the pain. My body would convulse and shake and, and I could drink anything else, tea, coffee, coke, anything. But as soon as I drank alcohol, my body would just convulse. And I thought, man, there's some power in this. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I think we're Christians now. We better go to church. Had no idea, had no idea, never been in 25 years. But I got to know him. I got to know him. What a privilege, what an honour to know the loving Saviour. And I got to tell you, when you know him, there's a, there's a connection, there's a source that flows. My constant prayer as a pastor is, Lord, make me the pipe. I want to be the pipe. I want to be, I want to be the pipe that you just flow through and touch people's lives. I don't want to be the tap. Everybody likes the tap. Everyone goes in the bathroom, oh, nice taps. <laughs> Look at the taps, they're beautiful. No one thinks about the pipe. Is that right? Behind the wall, no one thinks about the pipe. But you know, without the pipe, there's no connection to the source. Right. Saying, <laughs> Lord, come on. I want to be that pipe, flow through me. I've got to be connected to the source. I know you. I've had a taste. I can't live without you anymore. We call it born again. It's my constant prayer because when you know him, there's an automatic humility that comes into your life. There's an automatic understanding of this amazing supernatural God that is just bigger than big and bigger than big. The contrast is so huge. And I've penned this. I've said if myself is not humbled in his presence, then it's not his presence. Because in his presence, you can't help. Do you sing that song here? That every breath that fills my lungs, I give to you in praise. I think it's a Hillsong one. We're singing that one, one day at church. And I realized, you think of all these powerful people in the world. All the, all the planet shakers, all the, all the magnificent leaders in our planet. Do you know if they held their breath for five minutes, they'd be dead? Yeah. Why? Because he gives us every breath. And it doesn't matter how big man thinks he can be. And it doesn't matter how, how, how strong he can be, how powerful he is. He can't breathe more than five minutes. 
and God supplies that breath. The second thing is we need to apply God. When we know him, we have to apply him into our lives. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Because, see, the goal of Christianity is to be Christ-like. That'll be a revelation to some, I know, but it's true. What if salvation is not just something that happens when I die one day, but something that I can implement in my life on a daily basis? That I can be saved from myself on a daily basis. It's only got to get better and better. It's only got to get stronger and stronger. Because I know him, I can begin to apply God into everyday situations in my life. Everyday situations and become Christ-like. Not as a consequence, but as being deliberate. Being deliberate to wake up with a focus and being deliberate about today, I'm going to be Christ-like. I'm not talking about earning salvation. I'm not talking about good works. I'm talking about attacking the things within me that bring destruction and devastation into my world. And you know what? I can do that. Why? Because I know him. I know him. I see people say the sinner's prayer. But within 10 years, down the track, not a lot has changed. Yeah, they, they clean the outside up. They, you know, they're, they're looking better. They're, you know, they've, the, the stress lines are gone from the face. Uh, life's a little bit happier now, but, you know, they're still, they still live in fear. They still live in inferiority. They still have a victim mentality. They're still walking around like they lost their last dollar. They're, Everything seems to overwhelm them and when they're not happy or they get offended or disappointed, I've seen it for 20 years as a pastor. They don't, they don't look within and go, you know what, well, I, I need to change some things. I need to begin to trust him. God, come and help me. Help me grow and develop into the person that I know is going to be victorious in my life. And they become the victim. They never take up the cross daily. And I was challenged, you know, when was the last time that I dealt with an attitude my own? You know, when was the last time I began to look at my own life and say, Byron, what, you know, why is that thing still there? Why have you allowed that attitude or, or that offence to hold you back year after year after year when there's, there's salvation that has been given to you freely? that you can be saved from yourself. And my answer back is very simple. It's because I'm not the problem, it's everybody else. <laughs> I'm convinced of that. It's everybody else. Not really. We begin to apply God. Begin to apply this salvation. Every day, every day, begin to discover and look at areas that, that, you know, that I can become Christ-like. That I can begin to give him glory in those things that I've held deep within my heart that I now surrender and release to him for a greater purpose. Other than myself. When was the last time we... Somebody spoke into our life and said, man, you know what? The way you deal with your kids, you know, you're doing them damage. It's going to cause some trouble. Or the way you speak to your spouse, you know, um, if you keep doing that, you know, I'm a friend. Uh, I just need to tell you, if you keep doing that, you know, it's, it's going to cause trouble. Did we listen? Did we uh, 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 approach it and begin to apply the answer into our hearts? Or do we get offended and close the door and never speak to that person again? Because, you know, Proverbs tells us in 27.6 that wounds from a friend can, friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. 
And these are some hard truths, folks. But we're never going to grow unless we begin to apply this salvation to our heart every day. Every day that we can be saved from ourself. Ask the Holy Spirit, why am I feeling angry right now? You know, why, why am I offended? You know when you get your spirit sort of cut and you get, you know, it's like, why am I feeling that right now? Lord, this isn't your best for me. I'm done with that. I'm over that. I'm going to apply your goodness to my life. I'm going to apply that salvation that, that you died for so that I can overcome these things and become victorious and stronger and begin to rise up to be the person that you've called me to be. And not a victim. Because I've got to tell you folks, what will you do on the day when trouble comes? See, if you don't know him, if you haven't applied salvation to your life on a daily basis, the day when trouble comes, you will not stand. You know, pastor asked me to share testimony of a little bit about our lives. And you would think serving God, you've got to be in the top 5% trouble free. I mean, you've got to be at the top of the tree, right? I mean, you're doing it for Jesus, amen? Doesn't get better than that. In 08, I was in India on, on one of our trips, um, feeding children and, and so forth, and I had a lump in my throat. I might have shared this last time I was here, but it turned out to be stage four throat cancer. And uh, I got back to Australia and I went to the doctor and they, they confirmed it and did all that. And, and so we went through um, seven months, um, you know, of treatment and um, ICU wards and one thing led to another, led to another. I remember one night, one night I was in ICU. I, I thought it was my last night. It was Boxing Day, December 26th. And I was laying in the bed and they put me in the dying room because they don't call it the dying room, but they put you in a room. When they don't think you're going to make it through the night, they put you in the room because it's so discouraging somebody dying in front of all the other patients. And so they put me in this room and, and, and you know, I, I, I was laying there. I had tubes out of me. I had everything um, going on. And I, I remember laying there thinking, of all my theology of all of the Bible college days, of all of the sermons I've heard, of all of it was boiled down to one thing. Lord, I just love you. If you take my life, I'm okay with that. If, if, if you save my life, then I'll serve you as a, even greater if I possibly can. But the bottom line of every scripture I've ever read is, Lord, I just love you. I want to tell you it was in, in the dark of night that I was looking out of the ICU doors, um, out of this little room to the eye. I could see two windows. And I don't know what your theology is. I can only tell you what I saw. But there was a, a face of a demon in one of those windows. And I'd, never, I'd been to India. I'd seen some things. I know a little bit about demonic activity. And I saw this face and... and and there was this, it just kept saying to me, you're finished, you're done, it's over for you, I'm coming to get you, you know, you're, it, it, it's finished, you know, you won't last the night, you know, we're going to get you. And, and to be honest with you tonight, I didn't care. Yeah. I was so sick. They say you've got to be sick to die, man, I was so sick, I was like, I just want this to finish. I don't care. And after a little while of this accusation and this, this you know, this this, I, can't, I can't explain the way the words came out of its mouth. And, and I, I started to think, well, come on then. You know, why aren't you coming? Why, you know, and I noticed right then that around my bed was like this zone that he could not transgress. And I knew that night, I knew that night that I was going to live. I just knew it. I just knew that he was saving me for a greater purpose. And I've got to tell you, folks, 
in the hard days if you don't know him, if you don't apply this to your life daily, if you don't experience that salvation, when trouble comes, you won't stand. How do I know that? Because 20 years of pastoring, I've dealt with those with a victim mentality. I've dealt with those that that have the inferiority, those that are beaten down, those that are crushed and, and are unable to get up when all the time they've received the same salvation as anybody else. There's more for us, folks. There's more. And you would think that would be enough. I mean, I'm here today, obviously. I got through that and, uh, you know, lost 23 kilos, which was a bonus. It's a bonus. I don't, I don't you know, um, offer that as a weight loss program at all. Uh, it's, it's not the way to go. But then in 2012, I'm playing golf, which is one of my passions. And Because as a pastor, you know, you, sometimes you just got to get out there and hit something. <laughs> you know, I'm just being real with you, you know. Sometimes I see a face on that ball and I hit it. <laughs> and sometimes if it's a real bad day, I'll get up there and I'll hit it again. But I'm playing golf and I'm on the 12th hole and I get this pain in my chest which I thought was indigestion and uh, I was having a really good round um, and so I kept playing and kept playing until the 17th hole. I just, the pain was so severe I couldn't putt properly. And you know, to a golfer, if you can't putt, you can't score. So I thought, anyway, I, I, I said, guys, I'm sorry, I've got to go. I think I'm having a heart attack. And we swapped cards um, and... Uh, I drove off to the clubhouse in the buggy. And halfway there, you know, I'm, I'm driving with my, with my shoulders virtually because I can't move my arms. The pain is so bad. And I get up there and uh, they call an ambulance and I've actually ruptured an artery um, in my heart. And they got me into ICU and, um, and, you know, they did the operation and put the stint in. And, and that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> And I'm in hospital. Five days later, I'm, I'm packed. I'm ready to go home. Annie's preaching at the church. She's going to do the morning service, come down and pick me up uh, from the hospital. I've got my little bag packed and I'm ready to go home. And I'm sitting by the bed. I'm talking to a mate of mine on the phone. And I start to feel like I'm, I'm, whoa, I'm getting a bit woozy here. I'm getting a bit woozy. So I put the phone on the bed because I didn't want to drop it on the floor and break it. And I just died. Just gone. And, and the next thing I know, I'm in ICU. And apparently they tell me that they came in with the crash cart, you know, code blue, and, and uh, you know, they came in and brought me back to life. And I'm in the ICU, and I, I'm, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, I thought, I thought I was going home. Like, last thing I was, I got my bag packed. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm out of here. Cut this tag off. I, I want out of here. And I'm in ICU and tubes and things coming out of me everywhere. I'd been there before, so I knew something was up. <laughs> and uh, they were really worried about the amount of time that I was out because when the, when the oxygen doesn't get to your brain, you get, you know, brain damage. And, uh, you know, Annie said, no, he's always been like that. Um, <laughs> You got to know that's that's normal for him, and uh, as you can see, I'm here today. And I don't, I honestly don't tell you that to glorify myself in any way. Pastor Jim asked me to share those experiences because you can see the grace of God and the mercy of God. I was talking to a pastor the other day and he said, what would be one word you would describe God? And I was thinking about it and he said this one word, he said, merciful. And I said, whoa, yeah, that's me. Merciful, merciful. Listen, in the day of trouble, you need to know him and you need to know how to apply him. Apply that salvation into every situation because trouble's going to come and you need to stand. You need to stand, and I'll tell you why. 
Because number three, we need to release God. We need to release God. When you know Him, there's a humility that comes over your life and you begin to apply Him into everyday life. And I'm saved for eternity and also I'm saved internally as myself is being replaced by the nature of Christ. And when those things come together, you know what happens is this transformation that cannot be hidden. It can't be hidden. And everywhere we go, we begin to release God. We've got the right spirit, the right attitude in the workplace, in the schoolyard, at the university. People are attracted to you. Why? Because there's a spirit about you. There's a presence about you. There's a knowing about you. And it's because you've allowed God to do what he wants to do in you, to make you whole, to make you strong. And so when they're inferior and when they're speaking, you know, victim mentality in all of their conversations, you can rise up with a strength and say, that ain't my portion. I've been saved. I've been saved. I have salvation on my side. Not just waiting for my number to come up. But I live it every day. I live it every day. And you know what, folks? I'm a force to be reckoned with. Because he has enabled me to overcome in every situation. Now, I'm not perfect. Now, my, my wife might argue with you on that. But you know, I'm moving forward. Every step, I'm moving forward. It ain't yesterday. It ain't yesterday. I'm not there yet, but I'm moving forward. I'm tackling the next thing. Why? Because I've got salvation on my side. You sang this song tonight about the angels' armies behind you. Amen? I'd never heard that song before. I'm going, yes. Yes, that's our testimony. They're before us. They're behind us because God's got my back. And the reason he's got my back is because I'm saved. I'm saved. What if salvation is something I experience because I am deliberate about being Christ-like? I mean, think about that. I've passed it a long time. I've never seen two Christ-like people divorce. Never. Never. I've never seen people who are, who, who are, uh, are deliberate about, about being Christ-like, about embracing salvation every day in their life, divorce. Go hungry. Rub a bank. It's not in them. And that's our portion. That's what he died for. That we can have the fullness of salvation. A personal journey that is removing the areas of my life that cause destruction. And replace it with the nature of Christ. And I am actually becoming a better person. Now you know, I'm saying it again, it's not about works that we are saved. We're already saved. We've already got the ticket. We've got our number when that time comes. But we're being deliberate about being Christ-like and embracing that salvation every day of our life. I tell you, I promise you, you won't know yourself. Your spouse won't know you. You won't know your spouse. I asked this question to my church. Do you think Jesus would be a good spouse? I mean, do you think you could trust Jesus? Could you leave your kids with Jesus and you, and you could go out and be okay? Not, not worried? Hold on, I'm going to ring Jesus, honey, and check on the kids. I'm, I'm not feeling real good about this. <laughs> you know? Well, of course not. If, of course not. Now, we'll never be Jesus, but we will be Christ-like. Because that's what Christianity means. So it's not about being better than the next person. It's about being the best me I can be. And when we start to embrace that, you're going to have every person in your world saying, what's happened to you? Who are you? I don't know that person. 
you can say, well, let me tell you a story about salvation. I embrace it every day. It's better than breakfast. Better than cereal. If our nature was Christ-like, then we would be all those things that we love Jesus for. Philippians 2, chapter 12 to 13 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. His good purpose. I don't know about you, but that's why we're here. I'm here to fulfill his good purpose. And I'll do whatever that takes. I'll do whatever that takes. Why? Because he gave everything for me. He took a, a, an, an alcoholic, a hopeless alcoholic that followed the pattern of generations. Positioned me to feed thousands of kids. Me, a nobody. I failed grade 10. I can't even spell. And yet, because I know him, and I've endeavoured wherever I can, I'm nobody special, but I've endeavoured wherever I can to apply that in my life. And I've got a long way to go yet. But because of his good purpose... Thousands are touched in Jesus' name. Again, I don't say that to boast. I say that to say if I can do that. What about you with a university degree? You know, what about you, a lot smarter, a lot, lot more wealthier than me? What could you do if we embrace this full salvation? What lives could be touched? How could you release God into the world? with such magnitude, with such strength, with such mercy, that lives are transformed and God is glorified. I challenge every one of you tonight, if you say you're saved, let's do something. Let's build something great. Let's build the kingdom of God in this area. Let's take this area for Jesus. I told my church recently, we just had an election. I said, the reality is very simple. Let's just get everybody saved. You won't have to worry about the policies that go before government. Because if everyone's saved, they ain't voting for it. It's power with the people, amen? Let's get the people saved. We have the power. Is that fair? Very simple, one person, imagine one person. If all of us at the Rock Church just led one person to Jesus in a year, in a year, just in a year, one person, how many more thousands of people would be out there releasing God into the community and making a difference? Don't blame the governments and stuff, folks, on us. It's not their fault, it's ours. It's our fault. We're the church. We should be in charge. We should be the authority. We are the bearers of salvation through Jesus Christ. We are the voice. We are the arms that love and care and nurture. And if we're not doing that, then we will lose. But thank God. Amen? He's on our side. We've got the, what is it, the angels of heaven. The armies of the angels' armies are kind of before us and behind us. We're right in the middle of where it should be because we're saved. Amen? Let me pray for you tonight. Why don't you bow your head? Father, I thank you, Lord, that in this house, in this place right now, people, 
people that are breathing in and breathing out your spirit. Lord, in this house where there's an anointing and there's a presence of the wonderful Holy Spirit in this place, the we, the few, have this opportunity to embrace salvation in such a way that we will never look back. We will never be held back. We will never be hobbled by anything within us. But as you strengthen us, empower us, we will become the victors that you've called us to be for your glory, for the increase of your kingdom. Amen. Folks, I want you to consider salvation tonight. I hope you're not one that's sitting here with a number in their hand just waiting for that number to be called. Think, well, I go to church. Yeah, that, that's great. That's awesome. Continue to do that. That is so good for you. To say, well, yeah, I pray sometimes. I pray a little bit. Yeah, that, that's awesome too. But can we be deliberate about our salvation and embrace it? I, I want to pray for you. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand and say, you know, we're going to have a, 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 an altar call for salvation in just a moment. For those who for the very first time are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I want to be a part of this. This is too good to pass up. But, but right now, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything with my life for the kingdom. I know him, but I love the Lord, but really I, my weeks come and go and it's, I'm just sitting with my number in my hand. Can I challenge you today in love? Be a part of what God's doing in this house. Be an integral part. Stand up as an army together because you've got to make a difference in this place. You've got to be a part of what God's doing. He's planted you here. There's a vision in this house to win this community and everyone needs to be a part of that. And allow your salvation to transform lives as you release God everywhere you go. If that's you, please just put up your hand and I'll pray for you tonight. If that's you, if you know and you know what this means? This means that next week you're going to have to maybe sign up for a, uh, you know, a part of the church, a, a volunteer aspect of the church and say, I'm in. I'm going to get committed about this. I'm going to do something about this. I'm, not, I'm just not going to be an attendee. You know, I'm going to be a part of the answer. If that's you, come on, raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you right now. Fathers, you look across this place and every hand is raised. Every heart is open to you right now. Every one. I pray, Father, that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you would spark in our hearts a fresh, a vision. Understanding we are integral to what you want to do in this community. And I'm in. I'm in 100%. I'm in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the pastors if you'd come up and, and give a, a talk to those who are really wanting to embrace Jesus for the very first time. That would be great. Thank you. Well, tonight, like you heard Pastor Byron say, there are those of you in this place tonight that maybe you really identified with his testimony. Maybe tonight's your first night in church. Maybe you've been playing church for a long time. And tonight, I just want you to examine yourself. I'm going to ask you a question. This will help to identify where you're at. I'm going to ask no one get up, no one leave during this time. We've got a couple more minutes, then we're going to let you go here. And I want you just to examine your heart right now and ask yourself this question. What if tonight was your last night on the earth? By no fault of your own, maybe you got in your car, you started your car, your heart stopped, and you died. You closed your eyes here on earth in the here and now, and you opened your eyes in eternity. Where would you end up? Because you're only going to end up one of two places. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. But it's a very real place. And you're not going to heaven. You're not going to 
spend eternity with God because you say, I don't believe in hell. It's like me saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. You know, if I go stand on the slow lane of the freeway, I'm going to meet one face-to-face sooner or later. Same way you can't just say, well, I don't believe in hell. Bury your head in the sand and expect that it's going to go away. It's a very real place, and you got to make sure that you understand and know how to get to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You know, we've kind of come to an enlightenment. It's a new age, and you do your thing, I'll do my thing. The church is out there. They can do their thing. As long as we stay true to ourselves, we'll make it to heaven somehow, some way. And yet, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you stay true to yourself, that you get to go to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say, do whatever you want to do. Do you think God, after he sends Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross, after he goes through all that, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, the one who carried it out in his son Jesus. Do you think that after he goes through all that trouble, he'd say, yeah, whatever you guys want to do and whatever they want to do, it's all good. You know, I'll just see it somehow, some way. I don't even know what way. Just there's, there's all roads that lead to heaven. No, that's like us here on the earth saying all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want in any direction you want to go and you will never make it to the moon. In the same way, can't do whatever you want to do and expect to get to heaven. There's one way. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds. You know, I, I think I've, I've, I've finally gotten to the point in my life where my good outweighs my bad. I've gotten involved in social justice causes. I buy shoes that help kids in other parts of the world get shoes. I buy water that digs wells in places where they need clean water. I've given money to charities. I, I've helped my neighbors out and been nice to my, my friends and family. You know, I haven't knocked over a 7-Eleven in a while. I've cleaned up my act, and I think that now I'm finally good enough to get to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible says you can be good enough? In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it to heaven just by being good. can't be good enough. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible records, is like filthy rags. It's going to get thrown out. not going to get to stay. You can't make it to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you've always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians. Headed for heaven, denying our presence in hell, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents raised you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized as a Christian as a child, and you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people think, well, pastor, hold on a second. Not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now. Doesn't that make me a Christian? But did you know that nowhere in the Bible just say sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? That's like me saying, you know, I really like the Angels baseball organization. I'd love to play Angel baseball. And I go to the store, I buy a uniform, drive down to Anaheim, sit in the Angels stadium dugout bring my bat and my ball, call myself an angel and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen come game time? They're going to find me sitting there in that dugout, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a member of the angels organization. In the same way, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but hold on a second, Pastor, because, you know, I I got involved in my last church. I helped out. I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader, even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But aren't we back to good works now? Isn't that your goodness trying to attain to God? See, it doesn't work like that. We're not talking about good works once again because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. doesn't matter how much good you do. It's not going to work your way up into heaven. You can't make it on your own merit. God's not looking for your membership card to a church or seeing if you were considered to be a leader in the church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Sometimes people say, but pastor, I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Sing the songs at Christmas time. I could quote scriptures to you. Old and New Testament, doesn't that mean something? Yeah, it means you know who God is. But if you'd read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. You know, the devil himself knows who Jesus is, and he can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet he's not qualified for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus came and he said this to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. John, the third chapter, he said, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It's that simple. 
You must be born again. If you're going to make it to heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are going, oh, I saw being born again. I, I know. I have heard that term in Hollywood movies, television, books. I read about it on a blog on the Internet, and that's just weirdo. That's just goofy stuff. I don't want to have any part of that. But listen, if you don't have any part of that, you will have no part of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm not talking about the goofiness that's portrayed in, in present-day pop culture and society. Let's not let... Others define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart, and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. It's pretty gross pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I want to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to have everybody bow our heads, close our eyes once again. And I'm going to ask you that question we started with one more time. I'm going to ask you, what if today was your last day on the earth and you died? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? I want you to answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. And if you answer that question, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Maybe I'd go to heaven. I don't know. You know, I really do hope so. And you need to give your heart and life to Jesus tonight because you cannot think, hope, or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. you got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Maybe you're lukewarm in this place. You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Maybe in this place, you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life. I'm speaking to you. Tonight is your night of salvation. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, down at the cafe, or even online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, get ready to get your hand up. And then afterwards, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. So tonight, if you want to be included in that prayer, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Let's all bow our heads. Let's all close our eyes. I'm going to ask you that question one more time. What if tonight was your last night on the earth? What if you died? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Now remember how you answered that question is very important. Did you say, I think so? Maybe. I really don't know. Maybe tonight, as I was talking about being lukewarm, you said, that's me. That's me, and I need, to, I need to come back to the Lord. I need to go wholehearted for God. I need to quit playing games. Tonight is your night of salvation. You want to be included in that prayer tonight, giving God all of your heart and all of your life, experiencing that salvation that Pastor Byron talked about. Tonight is your night of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up all together on the count of three if you need to do this. I'm going to count to three and then pop my hand on this microphone. One, two, three, bang, just like that. If you need to do that, get ready to get your hand up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise above high right now. If you want to receive that gift of salvation, you're saying, I know I need to give God all my heart. No, I need to give God all my life. Thank you. There's one. There's two. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your life. Thank you. There's three. God bless you. Who else tonight? Three wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Just raise it up high for me. I want to pray with you. If you want to be included in that prayer, just raise it up high. Then run it from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. If you're not sure about your salvation, tonight is your night. Make sure. Thank you. Got you right there. God bless you. Got you. You can put your hands down right here. I got you guys. Thank you. Thank you. There's about three or four wise people. Anybody else real quick? You didn't already raise your hand, but you know the Lord's tugging at your heartstrings right now. Maybe you've been in church a long time, but... And you've never said yes to Jesus, never given him all your heart and all of your life, been playing games. That's you. Just lift it up high. Anybody else? Thank you. Got you right here. God bless you. It's five wise people. Just want to give you a moment to consider where you're at with the Lord. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. We're going to pray together, and I don't want you to miss out on this. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities. If that's you, just lift it up high right now. Anybody else? Thank you. Got you right here. Yes, God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else on this side? I'm going to wrap this up in one more minute if that's you. Just listen. Where would you go if tonight was your last night? If you don't know, come on, tonight, make sure you know. Anybody else? 
All right, well, there was about five wise people tonight. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. All right, all five of you, or if you're number six, number seven, number eight, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. What I want you to do right now, uh, especially parents, I think I saw some little hands go up. If your child raised their hand, just ask right now, honey, did you raise your hand? And if they did, this is their time as well. Tonight, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, your children raised their hand, I want to bring you up and we're going to pray that prayer together tonight. Let's all stand and welcome them. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, just get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend who needs a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. And we'll pray together. Come on down. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just come on. You can come right now. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on, if you raised your hand. Or even if you didn't, just make your way to the front right now. We're going to pray together. I want to include you in that prayer. Come on down. Nudge your neighbor say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, anybody else if you need to come. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on. All right. Hey, you guys, I'm just so thankful that you guys all came. This is awesome. I love seeing families come together. Now, listen, I'm going to take a moment and talk to someone else for a minute, okay, because there was more hands that went up, and I want to make sure. Listen, you don't get saved just by doing this. This is not going to get you saved. This is not going to get you into heaven. You've got to invite Jesus in your heart. They're still coming, all right? But you've got to invite Jesus into your heart, and then if... If you can't live for Jesus in a safe and friendly church service, what makes you think you're going to walk out of the doors of this place? You heard it tonight. We have to apply our salvation. It's not like it becomes a bed of roses or a cakewalk as soon as you get saved. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tests. And the devil can keep you headed for hell. He's going to do everything he can. But you're going to have to be bold and courageous in order to come and lay hold of salvation. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is advancing and the violent take it by force. There has to be something on your part that says, I, I know I need to do this and I'm going to do what it takes. Just like Pastor Byron said, every time the doors of the church were open, he was there. He went after God. And just doing this isn't going after God. You have to give God all of your heart. You have to give God all of your life. And listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it by playing games with God. I'm going to have him sing that one more time tonight. And if you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand but you know you're not saved, run to this altar tonight because we're going to pray together tonight. But I want to give you one more opportunity. Come on, let's sing that. And you come right now. Come on down. Come on. Come on, let's go. Let's go for God tonight if that's you. Come on. Hey, I'm going to pray with you guys just like I promised, all right? I'm going to give God all your heart. I'm going to give God all of your life. I'm going to be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. So let's all bow our heads. Let's all close our eyes once again. Everybody's going to join in and encourage you tonight. And I want you to just say this out loud. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came, that he died, that he was raised again to life just for me. Come into my heart, Lord. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me of my past. And give me a future with you. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'm born again in Jesus' name. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Praise God. So excited for you guys. Your new life with the Lord. Now listen, 
Right over here is my friend, Pastor Joel. He wants to give you some free information, some free literature to help you find out what to do next in your walk with God as well for the kids. All right? They've got a little comic book that helps them to remember what happened on this day. I gave my heart to the Lord. All right? And then he wants to talk to you about something we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's a friend in church. Come alongside you. Encourage you in the ways of God so you don't go back to the old ways, but you can go on with the new ways with God. Okay? Take a couple minutes of your time. It's easy. It's free. It's painless. I promise. Okay? And then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. You guys just make a left and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. God is good.